Coming up next on Triangulation, I'm Jason Howell, and I'm sitting down with Francis Dinha, co-founder and CEO of OpenVPN. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 375, recorded Friday, December 7th, 2018. Francis Dinha, OpenVPN. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by LastPass. Secure every password-protected entry point to your business. Join over 43,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. You can learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. It is time for Triangulation. I'm Jason Howell sitting in the hot seat, uh, the hot seat that I actually love to sit in because each and every week we get the chance to talk to people who are in many ways creating the technology that we do take for granted, creating the technology that we use online. Everybody has a wonderful story, an interesting story that leads to these technology products that we uh, that we use and we rely on. And that is absolutely the case with today's guest. Francis Dinha is the co-founder and CEO of of OpenVPN. Also, just in general, you're, you're a thought leader on private internet access and security topics and privacy and all this stuff. Francis, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's really great Pleasure to get you on you. today. Uh, OpenVPN, well, just VPN in general. I feel v, like VPN uh, has been around for a while, but at this moment in time, we're hearing so much more from an understanding perspective of people who are mm -hmm. more curious about what it actually means, why it's useful. And I think that just kind of has something to do with the, the current state of technology and security online. Would you agree? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, uh, I mean, VPN was designed for mostly for businesses and enterprise application for remote access, right? Yeah. So the idea was a VPN is really to access your uh, data and resources in a private network or maybe private cloud and using uh, the ubiquitous internet to tunnel your traffic from your device all the way to a private network in order to access uh, the data and the resources there because you've got a lot of insulated server and data they are in a private network but now it seems like um, well uh, privacy is becoming more and more important so vpn is being used to actually uh, kind of hide your uh, public IP address and, you know, and uh, typically you have a VPN provider acting like a broker or a gateway to basically, um, you know, protect uh, against malware and uh, also changing your IP address to a, a different IP address to uh, provide you with more privacy. So, so now it's becoming also, uh, I would say, more um, visible and more used by consumers as well. Uh, there are a number of use cases for the consumers, like one of the use cases, obviously, as you've seen uh, a lot of different uh, countries such as China and, and Russia and uh, Turkey, and uh, they block pretty much a lot of different contents. They wouldn't allow you to get access to Facebook or Twitter. So China, is, they have this great firewall of China. So VPN is, is used to actually circumvent that. And and, and have the, where you have the ability to access these kind of contents. So, so that's another use case is basically to circumvent uh, the firewall of uh, some of these countries who are blocking access to the free internet. So pretty much connecting you to the free world it will allow you to connect to the free world. Right, and, and what you're talking about kind of um, illustrates something that I was kind of kept going back to as I was kind of you know reading your story and researching <laughs> for this interview. is just this idea that VPN as a, as a technology solution, as a, as a privacy and security solution, it's going to be used differently for different reasons in different 
parts of the world, right? Like the reasons that we here in the United States uh, might might choose to, you know, activate a VPN and, and go through a private tunnel are going to be wildly different than some other places in the world where it's a matter yes. of, you know, like human rights. It goes down to the, the human rights aspect of, of free speech and making sure that they can live, actually live by accessing the Internet and not be threatened in doing so. That is true. But also there are some countries maybe might be going to the extreme and might make it illegal to use VPN. So mm -hmm. you might go to jail by using VPN, right? Sure. So so there is there is that risk. But absolutely, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, the use case in the US is 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 different than the use case in China or in Russia or in Turkey or in Iran, uh, Iran specifically there and all these oppressive regimes, basically, that they are basically not allowing their citizen access to the uh, to the free world. Sure. So it's going to it's going to it's going to be interesting. Well, you are um, your history has has kind of led you to where you are right now. Almost 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 perfectly in the sense that your I mean you didn't have the 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 typical childhood story that that people might be used to hearing, right? You uh, you had your childhood, lived your childhood in Iraq. Uh, mm -hmm. de mm -hmm. devastating circumstances there as a child. Obviously, sure. this this shapes you as a human over the years, but also, you know, just kind of stretching that out to this point to where you are managing and maintaining a service that helps protect people in oppressive regimes, uh, mm -hmm. know, wherever they happen to be. Your childhood had to have, you know, hugely informed what you do now. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I was born in northern Iraq. I was born in a, you know, as a Christian. And uh, as you can tell from my name, Francis, that's a Catholic name. So I was born in a Catholic family, raised as a Catholic. And I was born in northern Iraq. So and uh, at the time in the 60s, when there was a war between, uh, you know, the Kurdish um, that want to declare their own independence and it has been always a problem between northern Iraq and the government. So there was a lot of bombing, obviously, and um, uh, we used to live in a village. And uh, I remember those days of the bombing and I was only five, six years old. So we had to escape, you know, and leave all our homes. And uh, I uh, during that uh, war, we had I had a couple of cousins. They were killed. And uh, wow. all I remember, we were just hiding in caves and, and running away and and uh, and then uh, and then we had to move to Baghdad. And when I moved to Baghdad, when I was a kid, I didn't speak Arabic, even the language, because we spoke a different language at home. So our language is Aramaic, is Assyrian Aramaic. Aramaic is the language of Jesus. So we are the only ancient people who speak actually that language. When I tell people I speak Aramaic, they say, what? Aramaic? We, we, we didn't know that there are people they speak Aramaic. I say, yeah, Aramaic is close to Hebrew, but it's actually the language of Jesus. So so to Baghdad and, and Baghdad, obviously now being raised in a whole different environment. And uh, it was uh, it was pretty tough to see uh, to see how we how my my parents really struggled there in terms of uh, both in terms of financing. But but the other thing when I was growing up, I was actually always envisioning about, you know, I was very interested in technology. I was very inspired by. I remember those days of the of the NASA of launching, uh, you know, and going to the moon. And I was always inspired by uh, when I'm on go I am going to live in a country that I have a freedom. I can express my views. I can. Uh, so we didn't have that. We couldn't criticize the government. We couldn't uh, say anything against the president. And uh, you know, there were spies all over. And uh, if you speak, obviously you spoke of, against, um, you know, uh, the president or the government, uh, you could be facing jail or even sometimes execution, you know. So it was a very dangerous world to live in beside some of the economical struggle and uh, we had uh, when I was growing up. I mean, in, in some cases, uh, we didn't have enough money to to pretty much uh, have food on our table. We have we had, you know, so I had to help my family when I was only 11 years old in Baghdad, selling cigarettes, selling pretty much individual cigarettes to to survive and to have enough money, you know, to 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 survive. But then at the same time, I was very lucky, I guess, uh, you know, I was uh, pretty much um, 
uh, you know, one of the good uh, kid in terms of, you know, going to school and, and being the first in the class. I had to learn the language from from scratch, but at the same time, I was able to, you know, surpass most of my peers and, and, and became the, you know, uh, you know, very interested in math and science, and that was my passion. But I had also another passion, which was music. <laughs> so I used to play guitar, and I was very rebellious in terms of even uh, learning how to sing Beatles and uh, singing the pops music, and I was very interested in that, and that didn't blend very well in Iraq, didn't blend very well in Baghdad. So so at some point when I was uh, in my early 20, 20, 21, I decided that uh, I got to leave this country. This is not the place for me. It doesn't seem that I can blend in, <laughs> right? right? You know, I want to pursue my dreams in terms of pursuing um, the technology and, and, and at the same time, uh, the music, the freedom. And so I decided to leave Iraq and... Um, escaped to Sweden and apply for asylum in Sweden. So I was very lucky to be in Sweden. That was the first country that I basically uh, went to and I uh, escaped from Iraq. And, and then after a year, my whole family followed me. I mean, my brothers, sisters, my parents. So so that's when, uh, when I basically went to school there and uh, graduated there, the university in computer engineering. And I was even uh, at the time when I was doing my PhD and at the University of in Sweden, Linköping, I was also teaching at the university, teaching, you know, digital filters, computer engineering, computer science, programming languages. So that was very interesting to basically start from uh, a village in northern Iraq, you know, escaping the oppressive regime and come to Sweden and experience the freedom. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, it was very hard for me to kind of envision this. Right. Now, actually, I can criticize the government. I can really uh, express my view, different political views. That was uh, that was very, very, uh, you know, I felt so free about it. Uh, but then I had to learn the language, right? Swedish language. So I managed to learn the language and, uh, and pretty much, um, you know, uh, after that, uh, you know, there was the opportunity of, of coming to U.S. And that's that's what I did. I came to U.S. and to Dallas. And, uh, uh, you know, I was uh, in my early 30, 31 when when I came to Dallas and, uh, you know, I worked for a company called DSP Technologies and uh, start programming. And uh, that's uh, when I started my career and uh, eventually worked for uh, companies like DSC Communications, Ericsson and so on. Uh, but then always I had the dream of basically starting my own venture. That's when I uh, basically ventured into coming to Silicon Valley and Bay Area in, in the early 90s when I started my first uh, my first venture. So Man. so it's a, it's a it was a, it was very interesting, uh, basically uh, uh, mission and very interesting, uh, you know, journey for me and in my life. So. I mean, I mean, the, the entire story that you, you know, kind of laid out, there's so many components to this. And I think what, what sure. I keep kind of coming back around to is this idea that as a child, you had to make sense of chaos because, I mean, that's just that that's the world that you were surrounded by was, was oh, this absolutely. chaotic world. And through that, you had passion and you had this drive, this entrepreneurial spirit selling cigarettes. I know from, from what I understand, um, I, I was able to find uh, some, you know, mm -hmm. you talking about, about the, the selling cigarettes um, in a, I, I think it was a podcast or an article online where you would buy a pack of cigarettes with pretty much the last money that you had, that your family had, mm -hmm. and then you would sell them individually and be able to- That's correct. Uh, make the money off of that. And I mean, that just goes to show about like your creativity or your, your creative thinking mm -hmm. around entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship and man, just having the strength and the drive to do that as a child. And then what that leads to, like it takes, it takes a lot of, of right steps to make it where you did through all of that chaos and through all of that I, uncertainty. I, th I think if you have a lot of passion for particular things in your mind, and you're so focused on it and the passion you have, it doesn't matter what happens around you because there was a lot of things happening around me. Of course, I have to think outside the box. I say, well, how are we gonna survive with this? Okay, take a pack of cigarettes 
and buy it for a certain amount of the money and then sell individual cigars. And so that, right. you know, I made profit out of it, right? I almost double. <laughs> I was making 100%, 200% profit. And that that was like a light bulb. Time. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. you can do I that. I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. But you see, when you're so focused, I mean, even in Baghdad, there were instances where they were hanging in the street that pe like government used to kill people on the street. It bothered me. Of course, it bothered course. me. Yeah. And, and, and I was I was very bothered. But it didn't really got to me in terms of my focus, because my focus was was basically there is a better life for me. I need to go, I need to focus on my school. I need to focus on this. And that's what I had the passion for, because I had that hunger, that hunger of learning more, exploring more and finding more. So it was never ending for me and nothing really bothered me in a way. For me, everything around it, it was noise, mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that's really I see that an entrepreneur, how it is right now, how, how, how you have to think. You cannot think about all these problems as a problems. You have to think about a problem as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. How are you going to find a solution for a problem? Yeah. So for me, that's how I'm wired. When I see a problem, whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's a problem uh, economical, whether it's a political problem, okay, how can we solve it? Right? I mean, the things when it happened right now with the fire and lately that the fire we have, right? I was thinking actually, how can we solve that problem? I think we have all the components of the technology. Maybe it's a huge project, but there is a way we can solve this sure. problem and sure. we can improve it. So that's how I'm wired. You know, nothing really bothers me in terms of everything around me is it just basically, if there are negative things, it's, it's noise, okay. right? Yep. And I pretty much ignore it and I focus more on the positive aspects Man. of my life so so much respect for you to be able to to plow through all of that and emerge on the other side through that spirit and and i don't mm -hmm. think that I don't think that everybody has that. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people would, would love to do that or I want to learn to be an entrepreneur. And to a certain degree, there's just a fire inside of, of people yes. that, that they have. And that desire. You yeah, have to have that yeah. desire inside of you. Yeah. And that desire will translate into something like I had a desire like, for instance, you know, after selling the cigarette or working, I want to go back and really, really read this book and finish this book because I want to learn more about it. Right. What is the next? Or I'm I'm looking at some mathematical problem and I want to solve it. And I really want to go back and sit down and solve that. Right. So right now, the same thing when it goes to my business, I really want to take this company from scale up from from startup to scale up. How do I do that? Okay, what kind of issues we have in our organization? How can we, where are the weakness we have? I actually look for problems and weakness rather than strength in my organization. Because when I find some weakness and problems, that's when I tackle that and say, okay, let's solve that. Well, there's what kind of opportunity there. There's opportunity there. there there's an opportunity the, find the right there when you find a problem. Yeah. Well, some people, when they find a problem, they say, ah. Oh, Ah, oh, this is well, too bad. So all, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so basically, some people say, "Well, but I don't have enough money. I don't know what to do. Nobody is funding my 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 venture." I say, "Well, go figure it out. Figure it out. Find yeah. the money. That's that's what a, a true entrepreneur does, right? They they yes. see those those problems as opportunities uh, to be solved instead of to yeah. be a reason to stop. And that's that's exactly. it in a nutshell. So we we say we I normally what I say. I mean, my my daughter they ask me is what is the difference between losers and winners? I say loser they quit when they fail. Winners they fail until they succeed. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> we can all learn a lot from that. Let's um so so we're we want to definitely talk about open open VPN. This is kind of what sure. this whole path of yours has led to. And then maybe a little bit later we can talk about VPN technology in general and kind of some of your sure. views on the topic. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about open VPN. But first this episode right. of Triangulation is brought to you by LastPass. Talk about security, right? I love LastPass. Data breaches happen every day. Password security cannot wait. And if you don't realize that right now, then you're going to be left in the dust. You need to 
figure this out for yourself and also for your employees. If you have a company, if you have a business, uh, you want to stress, you know, with a good security solution, uh, their own security practices and LastPass Enterprise will help you do that. It makes password sharing convenient for employees while keeping access to corporate data secure. So every employee has their own secure vault for managing and accessing strong passwords. LastPass Enterprise offers centralized admin oversight, including the ability to set master password requirements. You can enable password resets, uh, restrict access when needed, of course. You can configure over 100 policies, access actionable security reports to keep tabs on things, create shared folders, uh, also SSH keys, uh, software licenses, uh, business information, database logins, all that stuff can be organized. Uh, and one of my favorite parts about LastPass is the password generator because coming up with a strong password each and every time isn't the easiest thing for us to just tap out on our fingers. Uh, this makes it easy to use unique random passwords that employees don't have to remember or even to write down. And the password autofill functionality actually makes it easier for employees to seamlessly use LastPass across mobile devices so they don't have to copy and paste from the LastPass app. It just autofills for them. And then, of course, there's multi-factor authentication, which makes things even more secure. Uh, you can use the LastPass Authenticator app, which is a ha causes a verification button uh, to pop up on the employee's phone to guarantee that they are the only ones with access to their accounts. And if those credentials are compromised, the app actually ensures that outsiders won't have access. So the employees can log into LastPass with their Microsoft Active Directory credentials, if, if they like, and data is encrypted and decrypted at the device level. So data stored in the vault is kept secret even from LastPass. Like I said, I love LastPass. I've been using it for years. I rely on LastPass and it just gets easier and easier to use uh, with every year. So you have that to look forward to. More than 16 million people trust LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. In addition to the enterprise solution, they also offer a number of other uh, uh, solutions. LastPass Premium for personal use, LastPass Families for the entire family, and LastPass Teams for teams of 50 or fewer. So take control of your business passwords. You can also reduce the threat of breach. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit today. That's lastpass.com slash twit to see which product is right for you. And we thank LastPass for their support of triangulation. So, of course, open VPN like and I know all of this kind of led to the point to where you decided, where you realized you needed to work for yourself. You had a couple of businesses, uh, and it's kind of sounded like with varying degrees of success between those. But as you know, many entrepreneurs would agree, you know, the failures are important as well to get you to a point of success. Uh, and mm -hmm. I would, I would say, and I'm sure you would agree that OpenVPN has been pretty darn successful for you, right? <laughs> yes, it's been it's been very successful actually, considering considering the amount of the money we've raised. I mean, we haven't raised at all much money. I mean, a uh, few, only less than a million, uh, a little bit over a million, I wouldn't say less. Um, 1.1, 1.2 million, I think we've raised from angel investors, mm -hmm. uh, but that's it. I mean, we never used that money and we were able to grow the business, you know, organically. So you never used much. that money. So explain that. You, you got the funding. What what did you use that money for? Was that uh, to to rely on in case things got lean or how did you? Yeah, how did you yeah. I mean, it's it's part of my nature, right? It's that kind of security that you have some kind of buffer there and that buffer will allow you actually. I would say I never spent it, but I, I, what I would say, you use that buffer to plan. So when you plan, you say, okay, I project my revenue in a year, it's gonna be say, I'll end uh, $1.2 million. And if you say $1.2 million, and that's pretty safe bet, that for sure you can get to $1.2 million, then you can say, well, I can go to a burn rate of $100,000 a month. So when you have $100,000 a month, you may not have the revenue right now, 100,000, maybe you're making 50,000 or 30,000, you're still in negative, but you know at the end of the year, you're gonna get that money back. So, and you, you're not maybe 100% profitable, but that's how I plan uh, basically the growth of the company, always looking forward some more conservative uh, projections in terms of the revenue. And then I would have some buffer that I can I can take that to the next level and to the next level and so on, you know. Got it, interesting. So, 
so you have this uh, idea for OpenVPN, or was like how did how did that come about? Oh, sure it's, you, it's you interesting. Some people early on and and kind yeah, of collaborated, of or of course, yeah, yeah. We uh, the co-founder is James Yunan. He's yeah. the co-founder. He's he's the guy that wrote actually the OpenVPN, the core software. So so James, when he started, he started the open source in two thousand two. We met actually in 2005, me and James. I was I started in 2005, more of a commercial version of VPN. So I was more interested in the commercial side of the VPN because I want to make money. I was thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. So we met and he said, well, I've got this hobby project, OpenVPN, but I don't know what to do with it. And, and uh, not exactly on these words, but I say, well, what about we take this and, and make it a commercial? And he said, oh, he wasn't sure about it. He said, well, I'm not sure really if you can build business out of it. I said, yes, of course we can build a business out of it. Mm -hmm. Here is a model for you, James, okay? This is what we're gonna do. Uh, he's as, as very, very smart and 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 one of the you know best software developer I've, I've ever met actually, I would say. He's, he's very sharp. Um, he's more of an artist, right? But, uh, and, and I'm more thinking outside the box and, trying to build a business, say, well, let's take the open source and build on top of it, more, maybe a better management interface, a better UI, and then we can we can deliver it through this channel to the marketplace. And that's exactly how we started in 2005. So we joined the forces to build both, keep it as an open source at the core, but at the same time, build a commercial applications out of OpenVPN. And back in 2005, let's say, uh, VPN, I mean, like like you said, it's more of a business solution at that point. Was, yes, was there, it was. Was there much of a market for this for consumers? Did consumers really feel like no. they needed anything like this at that point? Not really, but I had the vision of making making VPN on the cloud itself yeah. for, for basically as well for the consumer. But that's not really our target market. We started with a product called OpenVPN Access Server, and the Access Server is deployed by enterprise and businesses. So we've got thousands and thousands, uh, you know, of, of businesses who have deployed our enterprise editions of OpenVPN, which is basically the Access Server. So the core uh, of our business is really a business uh, for B2B. It's not the consumer. However, you got then after that in the late. Uh, I would say 2010, 2011, uh, we saw a lot of these companies coming up with the, basically their own version of, of VPN for the consumers, right? So uh, when, when a lot of these countries such as Saudi Arabia, such as China, start blocking VPN, that's really when it started, when the VPN started uh, for the consumers. Because a lot of these countries, these individuals, they want to have access to some of the content that was blocked from them. So... So we saw companies who took open source, our open source, and build pretty much a UI on top of it and, and marketing engine around it and market that to the consumer, you know, mm -hmm. for, uh, for circumventing firewall, but also for privacy and some other level of security. Um, so, but at the same time, really VPN is really built mostly for businesses and not for the consumer. The consumer, I would say, it's a very, very limited functionality right now. I mean, it's it's kind of a little bit misleading to call it VPN. It's just a tool for a consumer to get from point A from their devices to a cloud that is uh, the VPN provider. But then what that VPN provider is doing with that data, it depends, you know. Yes, you're encrypting the data from point A to point B, but at the same time, are you providing some level of cloud security? Are you providing threat management? Are you protecting against DDoS? Um, you know, all these kind of capabilities, uh, you have to ask yourself as a consumer, uh, can you trust that VPN provider? But at the same time also, I think uh, like any new technology, uh, VPN, it's kind of a double-edged sword too. There are a lot of individuals, the bad actors, are using VPN for piracy mm -hmm. and also for, for you know, doing some harms. Uh, as an example, uh, you know, a lot of people, while torrenting is maybe there are some good application, but a lot of torrenting that you're doing over VPN is really sharing some kind of illegal material sometimes or getting access to material that's copyrighted. So... So there is a lot of piracy activity when it comes 
to VPN, right? I mean, some of the VPN provider are not even afraid of saying, hey, if you don't want to be caught, use VPN. Well, that's not really a good reason for using VPN, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I came across a For Forbes article that you wrote back in October, and that was definitely, that was one of the things that you mentioned in the, in the articles that any VPN that allows BitTorrent should be avoided by a user, and I, I mean, and obviously, as, as a as a blanket statement, you know, as uh, as BitTorrent is a technology that has both legal and illegal, you know, yes. uses. Let's say it does. Um, but wh why why is that? Is is that a, like? And how can a VPN actually detect when when BitTorrent? is uh being used is that by analyzing the packets i think i think well, and, and the, let me explain just real quick the reason sure. i ask that is because i think a lot of people when they think of vpn they think well nobody knows anything it's all you know everything that i'm doing is obscured and that's probably a misunderstanding on the on the users part, no but. no so let me let me maybe explain what a vpn when when you have a client that's installed on your or your app that's running on your device Remember, you're encrypting the data all the way to the server, but the server is hosted by the VPN provider. Right. They're going to decrypt the data, so they're going to become your ISP. They are the internet service provider for you. You're skipping your internet service provider. Now your ISP, like Comcast or AT&T, they're not seeing your data anymore because everything is encrypted, but then now you're handing out all that information to the VPN provider. So the VPN provider can see all the data there, right? And basically assign you a different IP address. They manage that public IP. And that's the public IP address is gonna be visible, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what's gonna happen in that case, uh, basically it depends what they're doing with the traffic. Now you're typically, your ISP have the ability to detect things. For instance, if you somehow accessing some material, it's copyrighted, you typically, they will capture your public IP address. When they capture your public IP address, you're gonna get a notice. Your ISP will get a notice. By the way, this IP address have access some copyrighted material, and this is illegal activities. So what do they do, the ISP? They send you a notice. First time, second time, you don't take an action, they'll basically discontinue your internet service. Right. That's how bad it is, mm -hmm. okay? So that's part of the torrenting. I wouldn't say BitTorrent. BitTorrent has a, a lot of good use case. There is no doubt it's a very, you know, but unfortunately, a lot of these torrenting, how it's being used and the perception uh, is is torrenting is mostly for piracy, right? So, so when you're out there and going to a VPN provider, what the VPN provider is doing is saying, okay, I'm not gonna to do all these measures. I'm gonna put this server somewhere in the US, but I'm gonna incorporate somewhere in a, in a different country, or I'm gonna put the server in a different country, and now I'm gonna just encrypt all your data and throw all your data as just clear data. I don't care what you access. You access, you're doing torrenting, or you're accessing uh, whatever whatever site you wanna access. It's, it's, it's a copyrighted material, it's a legal, content, I don't care about it. That's that's the, the whole idea. But there is a double-edged sword of that because if you are just a simple consumer and you end up downloading a malware in your machine, well, guess what? With torrenting, it will allow you that your machine could be used as a zombie machine, as part of that ecosystem, which is really very bad. And now some content, very bad content, illegal content and it could be, you know, you know, I, I don't want to even child pornography could be in your machine without, you know, you have a knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The torrenting, if it's enabled, you've got the other peers and these, you know, very bad actors, you know, sharing all that data and that data that's broken into all these machines. So your machines and your resources is being used because this is peer to peer. Right. Yes, you can detect torrenting. You can detect some of these peer-to-peer -peer protocol. And we do basically block that completely in our VPN consumer product, private tunnel. And yeah. we can we can detect that. So there are mechanisms you can do that. But that we're not doing it because we don't want people to get access to legitimate content. And we're doing it because 
we think it's dangerous. It's a really a security measure we have to take to protect you against all this stuff, right? Uh, so, so a lot of consumers are unaware of that. Absolutely, I would, I would argue. Yeah, I would imagine that a lot of consumers don't don't think like they understand the uh, the general idea of what a VPN is. Yes, obscure my IP address. Uh, I go through this private tunnel and come out the other end, and no one no one along the way can can you know pick up my my actual IP address. But uh, you know they probably don't understand that there is this scanning, this content scanning happening uh, as as it goes along. Uh, what about free VPN? I, I, I imagine. Uh, well, I think I know your answer on free VPN. <laughs> there's so many of these services that say, "Hey, you know, our VPN is free and it's secure, and we don't log." You know, it's like, wait a minute, there's something fishy going on here. Well, there is nothing free, right? <laughs> exactly. There's something. Well, they have to make their money somewhere, right? Yes, I mean, I absolutely. don't know if you've read the article about Facebook where they bought this VPN, you know, provider. They were providing a VPN, free VPN, but it was very clear in their policy. Here, we're going to collect because now, again, they are acting like man in the middle. Right. They're going to be becoming your ISP. So what they were doing, they were monitoring every information you're accessing. Are you accessing what kind of app? And they were collecting some competitive analysis, pretty very valuable for them, right? Mm -hmm. So, hey, I mean, we're, we're installing you. You can use our VPN, but here we are allowed to collect all the information uh, about you, what you're doing, what you're not doing, whether I'm going to do it for targeting, uh, target advertising, whether I'm going to do it for doing competitive analysis. All that information is collected. There is, so there is nothing free. It has to be monetized and somehow they have to make money out of it. Absolutely. That, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, remind yourself of that. If it's free, there is nothing uh, that's truly no. free. VPN also can be seen, like, like we're talking about how VPN often is, is seen as a tool of someone with something to hide, in, yes. in quotes. Uh, in other words, I've got nothing to hide, so why would I use one? What would you What would you say to that person? Because I know, like Sonic is is uh, is my ISP at home, and though I don't have fiber to the home, if I did, it would all be encrypted. And they say, you know, that that they are the most one of the most secure ISPs in the world. So in order for me to get it with fiber to the node, I have to run a VPN all the time to kind of get the same that I would if I was fiber to the home there, but running a VPN all the time kind of has its downsides too. But what would you say to the person that says, well, I've got nothing to hide. Why would I use a VPN? Well, I mean, there are different things. Remember the ISP, typically internet service provider, uh, they're not in the security business, right? Yeah. So all what they are doing is they're providing internet access for you, especially if you are in a, in a public Wi-Fi like a Starbucks. Well, Starbucks is not gonna provide for you a security solution. You're just pretty much, you're connecting to the internet. You're out there, right, in the wild west pretty much. Mm -hmm. So the idea of VPN, if your objectives is just privacy, you think hiding your IP address is enough, it's not enough. Because once you end up in a page like Facebook and you, you're putting all your information there, that hiding your public IP address is, is not gonna do you any good. But there are use cases for security. If you are really security conscious, if you care about security, it's not just that encryption. I mean, encryption is one aspect. A lot of these VPN providers saying, oh, Wi-Fi encryption and security. That's not the biggest threat. The biggest threat is not somebody sitting next to you in Starbucks that's going to hack into your information. Most likely that's not going to happen. You know where the biggest security is? Some hacker sitting somewhere else, you know, that would be able to actually install a malware in your machine. So the idea of the VPN, a good VPN provider, will provide a very good ecosystem to scan the internet and know which malwares are out there, which bad actors website, and filter and block those websites. So basically, if you get an email as a consumer and there is a link, and that link somehow takes you to a website, that has malware, the good VPN will block that. And by the way, Private Tunnel, our consumer VPN, we block about a million malwares every day, believe it or not. And, <laughs> I and mean, where, do you get, just, where do you get that, that database? Like where is that database? The database, database is basically, there's a lot of companies such as uh, many, many basically security companies that they provide that kind of uh, update and it's all real time basically. Mm -hmm. And also we use IPS, which is intrusion prevention software as well to, to block that. One of the reasons why we also block torrenting, we're saying a lot of these 
malware, what do they do use? They use peer-to-peer -peer protocol to install something in your machine and now use your machine as a resource in their network, whether wh whatever they want to use it for, right? Sure. Whether they, they might use it for just mining, right? And making money, taking your 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 machine and just mine, you know, right. bitcoins or yeah. whatever, right? So so I would say there is more the security component than the privacy. Uh, the other aspects of this hiding your public IP address is not about too much about hiding your public IP address because that doesn't give you much privacy, honestly. Yeah, it might give you a certain level saying, well, we don't know your location, where are you coming from? But the most aspects of this, if somebody were to be a bad actor on the other side and trying to attack you with DDoS, now they're not attacking your IP, they're attacking the VPN provider IP. And typically a good VPN provider will have a good DDoS mitigation in terms of protecting you against all these DDoS. Got it. So. Interesting, interesting stuff. Um, let's take a break. We have to thank the sponsor of this episode, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about kind of more of these topics around VPN because there's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding around what VPN does. I also want to kind of ask you why open. I'm very curious to hear your take on why you went with the open approach with open VPN. But first, let's uh, take a break and thank the sponsor of this episode, and that is Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Uh, if you're buying a house, you, you probably know, or if you want to buy a house, you know that the interest rates are rising and you never really quite know when it's going to happen. I think I just heard a news report today that says that, you know, the thing is going to happen again very soon. It's very uncertain. It can create a little anxiety if you really want to move uh, uh, but you don't know if now's the right time. Well, our friends at Rocket Mortgage are doing something about making this a little bit easier for you, and it's called the power buying process. And it's super simple. Step one, you answer a few simple questions, and then they will check your credit for pre-qualified approval. So you'll have approval, and you can kind of get started looking. Step two, Quicken Loans will verify your income, assets, and credit. doesn't take long. It's less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval, which gives you the strength of a cash buyer. And then the third step, once you're verified, you then qualify for their all new exclusive rate shield approval. And uh, which basically means they're going to lock up your rate at that point for up to 90 days while you shop. So that rate is. Uh, is not good. You know, it's going to stay in place. If the rates happen to go up, if the Fed raises the interest rate, your rate's going to stay the same within that 90 days. So that's awesome. If rates happen to go down, your rate will then drop with it. So either way, you're going to win. And it's just, it's it's a wonderful way to, to approach this. It's what you'd come to expect from America's largest mortgage lender. So to get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Uh, equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. We thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. So let's see here. We're speaking with and having a wonderful conversation with Francis Dinha of OpenVPN. Why open? Why, why was open a consideration in the beginning and, and did it ever Absolutely. kind of, did you ever kind of think about open uh, as, as an approach and, and wonder if it was going to hurt your ability to market, you know, market a product or was that ever a consideration? Well, that's a very interesting question because a lot of people came to me when I met James and I decided in the open source, uh, there was a very appealing reason for it. And a lot of people, I say, well, wait a minute, you're going to be providing security and it's open. How it's secure if it's open? I say, here's the thing. Here's the difference and why open is more secure. Uh, either you go with the open or you go with the, with the closed. So what is the difference between open source and closed source? A closed source is meaning that, hey, trust me. So if you have a vendor that's providing a VPN solution and any kind of solution that's not open, it's mean it's closed. But you have to trust them that the code and the algorithm they have in there, because it's all about our algorithm, is not about actually the code itself, is the algorithm. What kind of algorithms you have inside there in terms of your, for instance, encryption, in terms of your cipher you're using, in terms of your negotiation you're using, all these algorithms there, they're all in the closed source, they're all closed, and they tell you, trust me. We will provide you with the best security solution. Yeah. Where the open source, we're open. So what happened there with the open source 
as an open VPN is subject to review by security experts, is subject to review by security researchers, and they publish about it. They say, okay, open VPN, it seems like is the most secure protocol and all the algorithms, all the methods in there seems it's very secure. Nobody seems like can break this, you know? Yeah. So that's the reason. It's not only just open VPN. If you look at the SSL, why, if you look at the most, uh, uh, SSL, if you see it on browser, they all use open SSL and open SSL, it's an open source. Yeah. Why? Because that SSL, it's all algorithm, it's revealed to the world and revealed to the third party to review it and it's subject to security scrutiny and, and everything. So I think open source, it's a pretty uh, powerful for a security product. You say, trust us. And that's like a statement that I feel like rings so true when if you ever go online and you're like, okay, fine, I'm going to do this whole VPN thing. And you do a Google search for best VPN or whatever. And you come back with hundreds of solutions and they all say, just trust us. And trust some of them us. say, we keep no logs or whatever. And then it, and then you find, come to find out later that they actually do. And I feel like that's and, one of the biggest challenges with VPN is it, it's what? really hard to know how to trust or, or what that level is is that you say, okay, I trust enough. Well, I mean, that's the thing about it. Actually, when I was talking with one of the service VPN provider, I met the CEO and he say, well, you know, one thing I don't understand, Francis, can you tell me about it? Because we have a lot of these users, 80% of them, when they come to us, they say, do you support open VPN? If you don't have open VPN, we're not gonna use your service. Hmm. You say, I don't understand the analogy. I say the analogy with that, because that's the most secure protocol. They trust open VPN. So that's only the protocol, assuming you're implementing open VPN the right way, right? right? If you say, well, if you say, I don't know what protocol it is or it's a proprietary, then stay away from that company, yeah, right? right. <laughs> I would say. The other thing is also, do you wanna trust the source of OpenVPN that actually deliver a solution to enterprise? Like we deliver a solution, like Google have deployed OpenVPN for their IT. We've got companies like points of sale, like Sycom, which is huge. I mean, they provide points of sales for Burger Kings and all that, and they care about the security. Guess what is it, their solution is based? It's based on OpenVPN. It's coming from us to them directly. Mm -hmm. So do you wanna do that or you wanna go to a third party who's taken our open source and somehow massage that and done some modification and say, we're gonna give you the solution. So, I mean, you have to, we have to educate the market about this. And, and that's what we're doing. We're saying, well, who do you trust? Do you trust that somebody is already being endorsed by thousands and thousands of businesses and enterprise who really care about the security? They have their security officer, their, their security information uh, officer reviewing this and deploying this. Uh, do you trust those or do you trust somebody of nowhere? Somebody has incorporated it or whatever in whatever country and now they're running a VPN service because anybody honestly with a few hundred thousand dollars they can go and run a VPN service and they can claim, you know, they have they have a security. So if you're looking for a real security solution, a real kind of secure VPN, you need to go to the source and not go just to a third party telling you we're supporting open VPN. We have this and, you know, trust us, you know, we're not going to, you know, do any logging and all that logs and all that. But but again, I mean, we we don't keep any information. I mean, we do have. We do have a, a kind of a, a free trial for for consumers seven, seven days, and then and then you have to pay for the service because we have to pay for the infrastructure. Obviously, yeah. you know we're out there to as well make money so we can support you know the the company as well and uh, our employees. So absolutely, um, absolutely. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yes, I, lo I love love hearing you kind of kind of parse this all. It's it's like my opportunity to to get clarification. Cause I know like I've had these questions over time and I understand a lot more about VPN now, but I understand also why it's such a confusing kind of concept to, to jump mm -hmm. into and more, more and more people are aware of it now. So it's, it's important to understand it. Shifting gears a little bit. I thought we'd uh, use the last few minutes of, of this interview to kind of talk about a few kind of uh, security and privacy topics that are kind of at the top of the headlines right now. Um, just a couple of days ago, Australia, passed a law that compels tech companies to hand over user data even when encryption is being used. Um, there's nothing that I could see in there that involves VPN specifically. 
yet, but I could see that as as kind of the starting point of something. What what is your take on this? Does it does this spell out kind of uncertainty on a worldwide scale? Because I, I kind of feel like we we see little hints of of these uh, these security measures being tightened and and uh, regulated, you know, by by governments that that want to kind of get rid of of, of these uh, loopholes. I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, that's a concerning. I mean, it's concerning about net neutrality and all that stuff, right? Yeah. So, uh, but one of the thing about about when it comes to encryption, the security, I'm not sure how much they can impose that. Definitely they can impose that, you, that you have to hand them the key, right? Mm -hmm. The private key for the, all that encryption and all that. But again, I mean, when we are a provider, that private key is not in our hand. It's in the hand of whoever the uh, the, uh, the the end user is whoever is the provider of of, of that particular uh, VPN. So if, if an enterprise is basically deploying a VPN, they have the key. We don't have the key. Now, yeah, I mean, as a VPN provider, we're only encrypting that last mile, right? But that last mile is not going to do do you anything because everything you're going through that pretty much if you're going Facebook, if you're going Twitter, if you're doing uh, Google, it's everything is HTTPS. So there is no way for us, even if we are as, as a man in the middle, as a VPN, you don't have to worry and you don't have to be concerned about decrypting because there's no way for us we would be able to decrypt that data. That means we have to be man in the middle, you know. And man in the middle that there is warning that we're going to have to inject different certificate and 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 basically uh, do the inspection of the traffic in clear. Uh, so I'm not sure how much uh, the government can impose that, but they have to go all the way to Facebook and they have to go all the way to Twitter to the endpoint and 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 put some regulation in, in terms of of intercepting that information. Or they have to create some level of gateways and saying, hey, if you are a transit point, then you're going to have to basically ask for the consent from the consumer that you're going to be a man in the middle and you're going to be monitoring everything because the government's uh, this is part of the regulation that we have to monitor everything. Right. It's yeah. like it's like tapping into your phone conversation, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And having the keys in order to do that, uh, I just worry that that's kind of the beginning. It's like, oh, well, Australia did it, so we can do it too. And then, the, you know, the pressure mounts, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of change can happen as a result of that. Obviously, um, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, obviously another big hot button uh, security topic. Anyways, a lot of people feel. You know, that with the amount of, of IoT devices that are ending up in homes, there's just not enough attention being paid to the security of those devices. Um, and, and of course, there, there have been some bills that have been passed, the California bill, or at least one bill anyways, the California bill passed a few months ago regulating the standards, security standards of IoT. I don't know how much teeth that has. And then now, I guess a few days ago, the House passed the Smart IoT Act, uh, which is leading to the Senate, which doesn't mean a whole lot unless it actually passes through the Senate. It. Do you think? Uh, do you think any of these solutions kind of have you know have enough teeth to them to to make any changes, or we're going to need a lot more than than what we see? I, I I think we're going to need more more than just policymakers because policymakers can only do so much, right, in terms sure. of policy and imposing. But they're not going to solve the problem. I think this is more of an industry that they have to get together to solve the issues related to the ILT in terms of of the security because. Uh, Internet of Things is everywhere and they are all phone home. Basically, yeah. you don't know who's the provider is, right? You're buying this gadget, you're installing it at home. And then next, you know, it's just phoning home and phoning home. That means. But one thing I think what we have to do is we have to educate consumers about this more and more. What I mean by consumers is is there if, if you're going to take these devices and just put them on the Wi-Fi, your own Wi-Fi, and they're going to use your Wi-Fi for all phone home, right, to exchange that information. That's where the security problem uh, comes in. So you have to be careful about this. Either either uh, install those in a separate in a separate Wi-Fi than what what you have, right? Uh, because otherwise, if, if you are in the same Wi-Fi and they pretty much those devices can intercept and can get information or can get access to your to your devices yeah. that are sitting on the same network. So one way of doing it, you can you can you can insulate that and isolate that in a different Wi-Fi. So it takes a lot of educations, and and the, you you have to educate the consumers and come up with these kind of different type of solutions. You know, um, 
another another way of doing it is is you could say, well, I'm going to impose kind of a VPN on every device I, I have at home. And the VPN, that the only traffic that I'm going to accept in and out to my device is going to be through VPN. So I don't allow a lot of these Internet of Things that's sitting at home can really access my 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 device. If it's not coming through the VPN, they're not going to be able to access. Because remember, the Internet of Things security aspect is more related to your network. Because yeah. when you install that at your home, what's going to happen is you're basically pretty much opening a tunnel. You're opening, uh, I would say, a, a link between your network and a third party. And that third party now can access your entire network at your home or at, at your business. So you have to be very careful about that. Yeah, you can do that because you don't know what kind of security mechanism we have. So if you're gonna work on your laptop and you have something important, make sure I would say have a VPN and have a reliable VPN that that doesn't intercept any information or doesn't allow any information in and out but through VPN, you know? Mm -hmm. So so that's that's another security measure that that you have to educate consumers about it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of education of, of consumers happening right now as, as relates to technology security. Um, kind of wrapping things up here, I guess my final question for you, what is your biggest concern for technology as we approach the new year and really just like the next 10 years? Are you are you uh, positive about the, the direction of things? Are you, are you worried about what you're seeing? What do you think? You mean in general about just, the technology? Yeah, just, or is, I mean, the, 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 sorry, I, I didn't, I, there wasn't a, a well-formulated Because thought. technology, obviously, is Technology is, is very wide. I guess I'm yeah. talking more about, like, security and privacy. We're seeing so many stories, so many threads here on a, on a political level, on a governmental level, and just, you know, with consumers. Are you are you positive about where things are headed? or, or Well, I'm, I'm very positive, but I think we have a lot of problems, and I see a lot of opportunities. And one of the problems we... We have. I think I'm very positive. Of course, I'm. I'm a nature a very positive person. <laughs> you are. <laughs> so I think. So I think it's going to be a solution. Yeah. So one of the things that I believe is, internet was never designed to really address the security issues. Okay. So one of the fundamental problem we have with internet, it's kind of a cat and mouse situation. So you've got the hackers out there coming up with all these sort of things, right? And then you've got all these security companies building some solution to solve that. But then again, hackers are coming with something new, and then you go, and then and it's never ending, right? It's getting yeah. it's getting way, way more complicated. And that's what my worry and the problem we have. And I think what 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 I'm thinking is we have to solve this at the fundamental level. And what I mean is the foundation. What is the foundation here of the internet? Is the IP, is the internet protocol? Is that what we have to tackle? We're tackling this at the higher level. Oh, let's do all these scannings and scanning of your machine. We're going to scan all your file. But fundamentally, when Internet was built, the idea was there. It was not about security. It was about scale. It was about reliability. It was about like anybody can reach anybody. All these packets, I can send a packet from point A to point B. It doesn't matter. It will reach there. There is no security check between the routers or what happening. So that's what the Internet so what we have to do is we have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, we need to solve that problem at the foundation. And I think I think we are working on some of the things. We believe that we have to really kind of build another layer on top of the internet. And that layer of the internet that has to allow the same services what we have, but build it in a such a way that is going to give us a better security layer at the fundamental, at the foundation level of the internet, the transport. We haven't solved that problem. So, so I think I'm optimistic. Of course, we're going to come up with a solution, but I think the current solutions we have, I don't think we're going to get anywhere with it. Yeah. It's, it's we're spending billions and billions of dollars, and there's always something new coming out, right? There's this, oh, there's this uh, basically malware. Oh, there's this this virus. Oh, there's these problems, you know. And and then security companies are rushing into finding a solutions and and solving all these problems, right? Uh, so I think I think uh, this is probably is not going to be an uh, never ending process. So we have to solve it more at the at the foundation level. And in my view. And of course, with the entrepreneurial spirit and vision 
uh, that presents a big opportunity uh, for it someone, is. yourself it's included. It's a huge to, opportunity. To, to jump so, in there and steer. So creating creating the next internet. Yep. Yeah. Okay. No, maybe no big deal. Think, this is crazy. <laughs> no big deal. The next internet. <laughs> that's That's easy. <laughs> Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Francis Dinha, co-founder and CEO of OpenVPN, uh, Private Tunnel, and just, you know, VPN and, and private internet access, such a big deal right now. And I've had a really great time talking with you all about it. Thank you so much, Francis. Really well, appreciate thank it. you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You. Everybody should uh, check out OpenVPN if you haven't already, which would be really surprising because everybody knows OpenVPN. But uh, Francis, best of luck with everything. We'll talk to you again very well, soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Bye -bye. sir. Uh, we do this show every Friday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern at twit.tv slash live. We stream it live there. Uh, and if you can't catch it live, that's okay. We have a bunch of people in the chat room. It's been a very interesting and fun conversation tied to the topic, and that's kind of the beauty of watching live. But if you can't do that, go to twit.tv slash TRI. That is the site. That is our home on the web where you can find all of the interviews that we've done, myself, Leo, and Megan, uh, as well as Padre and, and interviews from <laughs> from much further back. You'll see Tom Merritt on some of those. All of them are interviews with great people, so they're very evergreen. You can just pop in there and check out uh, some of these discussions with people. And, you know, some of them, I'm sure, are, are news newsy and timely, but all of them are very interesting. And uh, we hope that you do it. Twit.tv slash T-R-I. Thanks to everybody who helped out today. Thanks to Alex. Thanks to uh, Carson, of course, producer of this show. And uh, thanks again to Francis for joining me. Uh, I'm Jason Howell. Thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next week on another episode of Triangulation. Bye, everybody.